I remember it like it was 20 years ago, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm a bit spotty on the details, but I remember being at school, I got my lunch, and I was going to meet up with my friends and one of them was like, listen to this. I'm thinking to myself, okay, this track must be exceptional to disturb my hungry nature. And you know what? Once I put the headphones on and was gunned down by the opening riff, smiled at the singing just to be gunned down again by the chorus, I was stunned. Who the fuck was that? What the fuck was that? And how the fuck did they go harder than everybody else? The band was Kitty, the song was brackish, but how did they go harder than their contemporaries, barring probably Slipknot? I don't know, that's just how they got down. Kitty was formed in late 1996 when Mercedes Lander, age 12, met Fallon Bauman, age 13, at a gymnastics class in London, Ontario, after arguing about who actually killed Kurt Cobain. When they found out they both played instruments, Mercedes invited Fallon over to her house after school, and they jammed together. Morgan Lander, Mercedes' older sister, joined at 14 after their previous second guitarist, Sandro, left for Europe. Plus, she was open to singing, so that helped. They also had a bassist named Mel, who lasted about a week before Tanya Condler joined the ranks at age 14. They came up with the name Kitty as a juxtaposition of kittens that are cute and the brutal punishing metal that the young women enjoyed, although they did enjoy other genres, such as Mercedes' affection for New Wave and Fallon's love of industrial. After practicing for about two years, the band released their first EP, Sex is Hell, in 1998. They spent about $300 for the studio and made two versions, one with a yellow inlay with three tracks that would later feature on Spit, and one with a white inlay with a fourth bonus track called Jabo Fuck. Just a bunch of fucked up kids. And despite that song title, the band defends that they were raised in a totally normal, if not boring, suburban environment. But maybe normal doesn't necessarily mean functional or healthy. Or maybe they gave a voice to the voiceless, to those who they saw or heard were suffering. Or, or maybe it really was just boring but the girls were edgy. They played a Battle of the Bands concert at a local nightclub called Call the Office, and unfortunately they lost, but that's not all. Before the band recorded the Sex is Hell EP, they played at their high school talent show but were chastised by the staff and kicked off the stage. The principal reprimanded the girls for how they dressed and that they shouldn't be wearing stuff like dog colors unless they wanted to be treated like dogs. Obviously, this didn't slow down the band at all. These girls knew who they were, what they liked, and what they wanted. And that stunt motivated them to just continue. In 1999, they released the Kitty EP, featuring more tracks that would later feature on Spit. It was recorded live on the floor of the same studio that Sex is Hell was recorded, and with this release, the band was more methodical in their approach, and their bond grew even stronger. Then they got their manager, Dave Lander. And no, the last name isn't a coincidence, he was Morgan's and Mercedes' dad. After seeing how well his girls were doing, he quit his job as an executive at Daimler Chrysler and became the band's full-time manager, using his business acumen to secure a stable financial future for his daughters and their friends, and maybe just to ward off the grifters who would try to scam these girls. And as luck would have it, the owner of the studio gave Kitty's EP to Garth Richardson, as they were old schoolmates. Garth got in touch with the band and said he wanted to produce their album. Kitty also made their own look. They signed up to play Canadian Music Week in 1999 and met Jason Weiner, who was second in command at NG's Records in New York. After pestering him to see them perform, he liked what he saw and signed them up in the summer of 1999, which was when Kitty began recording for Spit. These teens would be enjoying summer vacation, writing their debut album. Kitty recorded Spit at EMAC Studios in Ontario, and although most of us would see this as a monumental event in one's young life, the moment didn't quite hit the quartet. 
I remember signing the deal, but it wasn't like the golden magical pen like, hey, you guys got your big record deal, Morgan said to Louder Sound. It felt very low key. We were so young, we were just here for the ride. We thought this would be a fun summer project. We were gonna press 5,000 copies of Spit, and that was going to be it. Yeah, well, the album sold over 660,000 copies, so talk about lowballing it. Spit was first released in November 1999, but when NG Records was bought by Artemis Records, the album was pulled and then re released on January 11, 2000, and received a gold certification by October. They had raving fans, dozens of fan sites, and toured with Slipknot right after the re release of the album. Then they played second stage at Ozfest with the likes of Soulfly, Disturbed, and Taproot. But perhaps their greatest legacy in the music world was their introduction of feminist leaning topics and concerns that were a staple of this album. Danny Goldberg, Nirvana's former manager and the head of Kitty's new label Artemis Records, said to MTV in 2000, There's a generation in rock and roll epitomized by Korn and Limp Bizkit, and for that generation of rock fans, there are literally no women. Alanis Morissette, who I think is a wonderful artist, might as well be my age in terms of the relevance to a Korn fan. We have a phenomenon where rock and roll is 100% male, so this to me was a tremendous cultural vacuum. Now, maybe it wasn't literally 100% male, but it was virtually all male. But despite this, the band distanced themselves from the feminist label at first. Morgan said to MTV in 2000, Equality is basically the theme that we like to express, but we're not necessarily preaching about it. We're not feminists. We don't even talk about equality in our songs. I just think it's time for another voice, not necessarily speaking for women, because we speak for everyone, but something new and something different. Now, Morgan's a pretty articulate and thoughtful person. Even back in the day, that's what her bandmates said about her. But here we find Metal Edge's Female Performer of the Year 2000 contradicting herself. If equality is the theme, how can you say that you aren't talking about equality in your songs? Years later, Morgan would reveal that the band wasn't sure what it really meant to be feminists at first, and only in hindsight did they see that what they sang about was at least a nod to getting equitable rights for women compared to those of men, and that would itself be a theme of Kitty's navigation through the music industry. Morgan, we were afraid of the negative connotation that can often come with it from people who also don't understand what it feminism means. We have always represented equality, even our existence challenged equality in the music industry. We fought for equal treatment, equal airtime, and equal pay as women. We represented those things then and still do now, even though we didn't realize that's what it meant to be a feminist. But Kitty also had to fight against a wave of misogyny, sometimes subtle, sometimes obvious. Kitty were tired of being asked what it was like being in an all-female band. It's no different than any other band. Some people didn't believe that they played their own instruments, even though they watched them live. The song titles may have seemed sexually provocative, but if you listened to the lyrics, you would see what the song was really about. In 1998, they got a death threat from the girlfriend of a guy that played in another band saying that if Morgan tried to crowd surf, she would be stabbed. If that wasn't bad enough, when Morgan tried to get closer to the audience, they tried to strip her, kiss her, and she even had people's hands down her pants. They had an interview where the journalist asked the girls if they were still virgins. The journalist, who was also a woman, was kicked off the tour bus. Allegedly, Mike Cox from Cold Chamber didn't like Kitty because he didn't believe they wrote all of their music? This was shared in a media clip from German channel Viva Zoe in June 2000. Then there was the time a guy rushed the stage and punched Morgan in the face, causing Jen Arroyo, who was bassist at the time, to clobber him, which gave Morgan the opportunity to jam her guitar up his ass. They took it down. Anyway, this guy gets on stage and punches Morgan in the face, Jen like, punches him in the head and stuff uh, because 
what the fuck? And then Morgan grabs her guitar and shoves it up his ass. Yeah. Wow. Like, yeah, right like the headstock. I just, uh-huh. just like uh-huh. right. And just, you like, could hear the right guitar go. <laughs> wow yeah so You're like but that's the thing like so jen asshole. like told like that this guy is, did like he got yeah, what he, he did, deserved yeah like, he absolutely got what he deserved i i remember it that's so <laughs> fucked up i remember it like it was yesterday <laughs> because he started low like i was watching him and it looked like he was gonna go after her so i had my eyes on him and then when he went for it it was like that's not happening today brother needless to say this show was pretty much done after that point but it goes to show the fucked up shit that the band went through, and I'm not even sure if the shit I just mentioned was even half of their incidents. It is really hard to imagine stuff like that happening today, but a bunch of teenagers blazed a trail so that other artists could express themselves and their identity with at least less bullshit to deal with. Okay, so I'll be honest, the first time I heard the album, I loved some tracks, but was disappointed by a few. I think certain structural choices of a few songs really left much to be desired. However, the songs that I loved compensated for those few tracks that you know felt like a letdown. And I think the nostalgia of the lower budget, almost DIY sound has made me like this album so much more now. The title track is both the acid test and the acid wash for entry into the album. If you don't like what Morgan is saying or screaming, this probably isn't for you, even if you might be the one who needs to hear it the most. Spit was pretty well summed up by its final bars. Why do I get shit all the time from you men? You are swine. You think dick is the answer, but it's not. Mercedes spoke to the Washington Post saying, we're intense and a lot of people just don't expect it. That's why Spit is my favorite song in the world. People expect us to suck, then we get on stage and blow them away. One minute they're just standing there, then their mouths drop open and their dicks feel small. Charlotte might be my first or second favorite track of the project. The first time I heard it and read the lyrics, I assumed they were still addressing being mistreated by boys, where you know they got what they wanted and then they disappeared in the first verse. But by the second verse, dude's head is in a closet and the body's out of sight. However, Morgan actually got inspiration for this song after reading Rites of Burial, which was about the serial killer Robert Burdello, aka the Kansas City Butcher. With no label intervention and no a and these teen girls were just cutting their teeth on this album, so there were bound to be a few misses or near hits. Paper Doll is about being more than just a blow-up doll for a male fantasy. But if I'm being completely honest with the sound of the track, it's a letdown. The haunting guitar at the chorus when the lyrics quote, now her soul is dead, now her body's raw are sang, made me anticipate a killer response that unfortunately didn't come. But then again, maybe suck was supposed to be that killer response because it's deadly. It highlights the contrast between hating someone who makes you feel bad about yourself, but still caring about them and your relationship. It's also one of my favorite songs in terms of the contrast between clean vocals and screams. In Do You Think I'm a Whore, Morgan confessed that the song is about how others perceive her and the band in a male-dominated industry, but also about how she perceived herself. The song continues exploring the toxic relationship dynamic, and two things stand out for me. Firstly, Morgan is 17 at this point. She must have had or witnessed some shit in her few years on earth at this time. Secondly, I don't get how she was ever insecure about her singing voice. It's as palatable as chocolate chip pancakes. Sweet, sincere, earnest. Yes, pancakes are earnest. Speaking of witnessing some shit, Brackish, the song that pretty much launched the band into superstardom, was about a friend of the band that was going through a tough time in her relationship. However, according to Mercedes, the song we know and love almost didn't exist. She spoke to Louder Sound, saying, I'd call that song an afterthought. We weren't even going to record it for Spit at all. Morgan added, There is no video or audio recordings, pre-recording of Spit, that have brackish in them in its current incarnation. The song we played before that 
was in a different key and the song structure was the same but it was very basic we recorded it but then we weren't sure if we were going to put it on the album or leave it as an instrumental rob nation the band's sound engineer for the album got his friend dj dave to add some jungle what we would call drum and bass today into the composition the price case of beer it worked then Morgan got to work on the lyrics weeks later to elevate the song into the new metal anthem it is today. But I hope their friend made it out of that situation. Johnny is decent. Well, not the guy because apparently he's been a bad boy. I especially like the verses and the bridge of this track as it explores the topic of misogyny, even if it does carry some generic riffs with it. And to be fair, Trippin is guilty of the same. Kitty is still there, their unique aspects are still present, but are hidden behind the tried, true, but also tired, tire tracks of their predecessors. And yet, having said all of that, I feel no need to skip Trippin. Johnny, yeah, probably I'll skip Johnny. Trippin, nah, it's still too much fun. Thankfully, Raven steps in and totally saves the day. This song was inspired by a death threat the band received from an all-male band that they competed against in a talent competition. But I am not sure if this is the same or a different death threat from the one previously mentioned. I just assumed they had more than one even in this early era. If you ever wanted an anti-harassment song, you'll be hard pressed to find a better one than this. When the tempo switches up and launches into get away from me, stay the fuck away from me, that's your rally cry right there. As a guy, the bridge is a kick to the gut. How many times have you heard women being cautioned to not go out at night and to have their walls up in the fence? Raven is a cry for freedom, but a heavy and catchy one at that. Remember when Kitty were told to get off the stage of their high school talent show? Yeah, well they wrote a song about it. Get Off, appropriately titled, would be absolutely killer if only the instrumentation in the chorus had fit better. The intro is a nod to Korn, but it's perfect for the entry into the verse. Listening to the early version of the track on the Sex is Hell EP, the chorus riff is the same, which you know leads me to think they really liked it, and so they kept it. Uh, but the bridge, the bridge is killer though. The lyrics without the context of the talent show read a bit grimmer, don't they? But the lines, you take me down, you're too strong, and dark issues, rude, vulgar, obsessive, not true, do point to the power of a school principal and their bias for their, you know, academic and, you know, their idea of what decorum is. Obviously, we know who Morgan is telling to eat a dick. Choke features some vocals from guitarist Fallon, and she gave some insight into the track if the lyrical content wasn't obvious enough. She said, That song's about someone telling you that they love you so much and they put you up on a pedestal and make you feel great. Then they turn around and say, screw you. And that's putting it lightly because based on the lyrics, this sounds a lot like grooming. Nevertheless, new metal lyrics tend to get a bad rep for sounding like some teenage shit, but this is literally written by teenagers about a teenage issue. It's extremely raw while maintaining a great groove. And Immortal is the instrumental finale to an album that has its flaws, but shows its fangs as well. This wasn't Kitty's highest quality recording, it wasn't even their heaviest offering, but maybe it's the one with the most heart. And in new metal, that's pretty much the key ingredient to escape the bargain bin of your local Target or Walmart CD section, because the fans will always sniff out the realest motherfuckers. Yes, being young women was a contributing factor. But they were more explosive than almost all of their older male peers. They blazed the trail not just for women in metal, but women going into any male-dominated arena. They weren't a band with a female front woman fulcrum. They didn't even want to be thought of as female first. They just wanted to rock, and they accomplished just that. They had to go through a ton of shit that their peers wouldn't, and at a very young age, but their summer project was a rousing success and 22 years later, we're still talking about it. 
Thanks for watching.